Welcome to the Crazy Wisdom Podcast. Uh, today, my guest is Gary Poster. He is the VP of Engineering at Manifold. Uh, great to have you here. Thanks. Great to be here. Um, and so, what are you most excited about right now? <laughs> uh, I'm excited about talking with you. Uh, after that, I'm excited about uh, stepping out of my uh, little office house and going into my house to see my family. Cool. And how long have you been doing remote work? Uh, gosh, <laughs> probably over 10 years, maybe 15. I don't know. A while. And that's really cool that you can work in your house and then go see your family. What are the other kind of biggest things that you've enjoyed about having this remote work over the past 10 to 15 years? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's lots of stuff about what people get out of remote work in general. So I'm going to be personal. Uh, I have really enjoyed, obviously, uh, spending time with my family. Uh, I enjoy very much not having to get in traffic for work. Um, I have also really enjoyed getting to work with people uh, certainly all over the country, but more often all over the world. Um, Canonical was particularly widespread, uh, the folks who uh, build Ubuntu. And uh, Manifold is significantly uh, towards the Canadian side. So uh, I get to work with some folks up there. So that's really interesting and something I haven't talked about yet, which is that uh, the global nature of working with other people. So I was thinking today, everybody is in a bubble and a lot of people here in San Francisco talk about like everybody's in a bubble and we shouldn't be in a bubble. But then I was thinking there's no way you can't be in a bubble because you can't really like have more than 150 people in your, in your, I mean, you can have more than 150 people in your social network, but about that, that's, that's about the scale at which you stop being able to uh, think accurately about other people. Uh, and you right. can train it, it's something you can train, but there is an upper limit on how how many people you can can get involved with. So by default, everybody is in a bubble because of, of just the nature of being a human being. And mm -hmm. so you, you can't really break that. And so it's like, there's this pejorative sense to it when people in San Francisco talk about that. Mm -hmm. But so, but you've got a bubble and like most of the people doing remote work are usually engineers, um, a, a lot of other people now, but yeah, I imagine 10 to 15 years ago, like the only people who were doing it were vast majority of people who are doing it were uh, engineers. And so engineers themselves have a particular way of being, uh, although that is varied as well. And, but you, have, you can also meet a lot of engineers from a lot of other countries. Um, I guess the question would be, how does, have you noticed any patterns that have emerged from culture intersecting with this bubble of being an engineer? Hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> sometimes there's, uh, silly ones like, uh, I don't know, not that silly sometimes, but, uh, different cultures have different, uh, approaches to being on time. And so in America, there's very much, uh, a, a feeling of, um, on time is late and, uh, early is on time. And, uh, in other countries, that's not the, the feeling. Sometimes it's, I've shown up and, you know, it's a few minutes late and that's when we show up and we talk for a little while and we socialize and that's what we do. And uh, so <laughs> that, uh, that gets to be a bit of a, a, a challenge that you have to work through. You know, it's no big deal. You just have to set expectations and then uh, stick with them. Um, anything else? Uh, we, we get to be in the English language bubble, I guess. Uh, speaking of bubbles, you know, like uh, I've worked with a lot of Brazilians. I've worked with folks in uh, Eastern Europe uh, and everybody speaks English and that's what I speak too. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it, they have to do all the hard work, I guess is the point I'm making. Um, and sometimes, you know, in remote work, writing is super important. And so uh, that can be a challenge with folks for whom English is not a first language. And uh, that's an issue sometimes, but 
in general, I'm always um, embarrassed that all I've got is English. <laughs> it's interesting because that's actually something I'm, I'm starting to investigate on the show is I've been doing interviews in, in English for the last couple of years and I want to cross the linguistic border of the internet because there is a linguistic border of the internet. Um, and I, I do speak Spanish, so I'm going to start doing a lot more interviews in Spanish. Um, mm. But then there, this that is a really interesting point that you make that most of the other developers, even if they're in another country, they're going to be speaking and doing their work in English. And this is something I first noticed when I went to Brazil and, and uh, my co-founder, he spoke English because he had gone in an exchange in the United States. And because of that, he was opened up to a world of um, information on how to start companies like uh, from mm -hmm. Y Combinator and Peter Thiel and all this different stuff that none of his peers could access if they didn't speak English, which is really interesting. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that is the, there's a bubble as well, because if anybody, it's not only they're engineers, but they also speak English. So that probably means that they also, uh, get access to Reddit. And this is a, such a, like a big question for me is like this globalization thing that's happening as, as, as the world becomes more globalized. English is the medium, it seems like the main place where a lot of the stuff goes out in English. Um, but I'm wondering what will happen as these other languages also start to build cultures that are uh, it, within their languages as well and what the, the, the crossover will be. Um, I don't know if you have any insight on that. If not, I can ask another question about remote work. Well, I don't know. Uh, the thing that it strikes me is sort of passing thoughts I've had of uh, China is certainly the obvious one, you know, where it's just like huge amount of technical work going there and so many different walls. Uh, and we start to see some of that shared, but um, I wonder to what degree we ever will. Um, at Heroku, I was exposed a little bit to the Japanese community uh, because of Ruby. And uh, so that is a, uh, you know, that's clearly a world and it's almost like, <laughs> it feels like almost like there's these tendrils between cultures, you know, where the people who speak the language start to do a little bit of translation and you start to feel like you're touching them through this connection. Uh, and um, it's cool. I suspect it's, healthy for us also as we get a feel um, but it's really <laughs> I, I'm, I'm impressed you know Spanish I've just dabbled in everything so you know we're, from my perspective I'm always leaning on everybody else to make that connection everybody else is making that investment which I am very appreciative of but also feels very privileged mm -hmm. uh, so. this is a very good point about China because China definitely has its own uh, unique culture that is have, have, do you have you have you ever tried TikTok? No, I've tried. I have I have uh, teenage kids, so I've tried to avoid TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Are they using it? No, they're friends. They're friends. <laughs> so it's super interesting. One of my friends, uh, he is uh, American born, but his he speaks uh, I believe Mandarin. Uh, it might maybe Cantonese, but he 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 speaks Mandarin, I believe, and he is posts on Facebook about all of his insights from watching TikTok in Chinese. And it is really interesting. He posts videos and it's just, it's, it's, it's mind blowing that, that there's this phenomena of a social media company starting outside of the U S and then coming into the U S and then the same behavior for a lot of teenagers are starting to use it here. Uh, and it's, it's very interesting to get a peer, a, a peering into how this is being used by the Chinese and, and, and their own culture. I've, and I've, I've actually, I haven't thought about this for a few months, but one of the things that was coming up maybe six or seven months ago was, I believe that there probably will be a cultural, I shouldn't use this word, but cultural revolution in China <laughs> uh, towards a hippie revolution. Like I imagine mm. that China will also have a hippie revolution and there will mm. be a kind of a questioning of conservative values, but maybe that's just my Western understanding of the way the history works. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, what that makes me think of is, um, so I, I'm a, maybe, well, in part because of canonical, which is European. So, uh, they were very much into lean rather than agile. And uh, similarly, my dad was in uh, the carpet business in mm. the Southeast of the U S and where that was uh, back in the eighties quality is free. Lee Iacocca, you probably, I don't know <laughs> all this Ford stuff anyway, but so lean is sort of my framing and 
uh, the Toyota process is uh, where you often think about with lean. And the Toyota process is so, uh, it, it, you know, a lot of the ideas came from some of the East-West dialogue, but when you read the Toyota process, it really does feel like you're looking into not only the ideas of lean, but the culture, the Japanese culture shaping those things. Mm. And uh, I find that interesting, but probably beyond my ability to comment on it intelligently. <laughs> <laughs> What is, what is the difference between lean and agile? Uh, I mean, you know, you're probably, uh, we're probably angels dancing on the, the head of a pin here, but um, in my own mind anyway, I would say uh, agile in America, we tend to associate with scrum and lean is of course the same basic world and someone might say oh yeah lean is a kind of agile agile is a kind of lean um i associate lean with kanban and um mm. the uh like uh work in progress limits and uh and stuff like that that uh, again you can sort of tie directly to the toyota process and so this brings up a question what is the most important thing that you've learned about working and this doesn't have to be tied to remote or anything like that but what is the most important thing that you've learned um, about yourself or about working in teams that might be helpful for somebody else to understand who's just getting started in their career hmm. <laughs> uh, the first thing that comes to mind is is meta um, which is the most helpful thing for me has been to get to know myself um, and get to know my, uh, challenges, get to know, you know, like, uh, I went through a, a long period of reading a number of books on how to give and receive feedback because I was like, Hmm, I tend to explode in anger <laughs> rather than actually communicating. This seems like it could be better. I wonder what I can do. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that came from learning that was my personal challenge and that's not going to be somebody else's challenge, uh, but really taking the time to contemplate who you are um, has been probably both the um, most important thing for me and I'd argue one of the important things I try to bring as I build teams and cultures and companies. Um, how, do, how do you uh, help someone else figure out who they are? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, part of it is going to be showing that you're doing that showing like uh, modeling the idea of tell me more about what you're seeing about me, telling stories about how you went from X to Y, which I often find to be a really powerful tool. Um, and, uh, and then there's the obvious ones of reflecting. This is what I heard you say. This is feedback. This is what I observed. Um, and, you know, when you read all about how to present feedback, they always say, you know, you say what the objective things are, then you say what, how, you know, how it makes you feel. And I feel that this is a way of helping people again, understand who they are. I don't know if I, uh, I was a, uh, a music, like all of my degrees are in music. That was mm -hmm. my background. And so one of the things I had to do in, um, when I was studying opera was, um, was study acting. And uh, one of the things you have there is that you're, you're trying to take on someone else's um, position. And one of the schools there is to say, everyone is in you and you are in everyone. You can read a character, you can read a character and hear what all of the different observations are in a play. And what you hear 
about that character is what helps you figure out what's important about that character. And then you can pull something out of yourself that, um, that matches that. So uh, maybe pretty tangential, but uh, the observational aspect of um, giving feedback, I think can help people as well as they discover themselves. But again, I'd go back to the, the fundamentals of modeling. Mm. And this brings up something interesting about how it seems for young people, either because of cultural or maybe just a factor of being young is that we, uh, we kind of take a lot of shortcuts or want to find the shortcut. Uh, and I don't believe there is any shortcut to self-awareness. I don't think there's anything you can like do a shortcut, like, oh, okay, the, 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 this is a way to kind of skip all of that hard <laughs> stuff about, about finding out who you are. Um, but then, but then uh, uh, certainly in my own life, I tried to find a bunch of shortcuts and to, and to figure out how to, how to do that. Uh, and then I'm, you know, and then I've had to go back and do all the long stuff. And I had started exactly <laughs> where I, where I would have started like 10 years ago if I had just, if I had not tried to take the shortcut. And I'm so, so I'm curious is like, is there anything we can help younger people understand that there is no rush with <laughs> uh, <laughs> self-awareness? Yeah. Well, an easy one is, uh, unfortunately, this is, is trite, but uh, you hear people who have gone through this often saying, uh, the, the more I know, the less I know, you know, those sorts of things. And uh, I guess the, <laughs> the comfort I could offer and the, the, the suggestion to take it easy would be, as you come to know yourself, you come to realize how... <laughs> how much more you have to work on, how much more you have to learn about yourself, how much you really still need to, to grow. Um, and uh, I don't know, like I face challenges every day that are new and unique mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, which in similar way, you know, which feels very similar to where I was in my twenties. I just am able to be a little bit more philosophical about it. And this is interesting because this gets into technology and because the rate of change in technology is so quick that you need to adapt your skills all the so quickly. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that in your life that that's still true? I imagine you're managing a lot more, maybe not doing as much technical work. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how, how does that affect a manager in terms of their, the rate of change in technology and the rate of tooling that's changing all the time? How does that affect a manager's job? I mean, the entire landscape is changing mm. uh, very quickly. Um, you know, uh, I, I I am not a Kubernetes operator. However, <laughs> I can talk to someone intelligently about Kubernetes. I can uh, talk mm. to somebody intelligently about how to... Uh, how to build the microservices in this context and um, what the operational challenges are going to be as we look at web components and blah, 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 blah. You know, like I'm not doing the technical work per se at that level, but if you are still working in the technical field, you still have to be aware of the context. It's sort of like I have to be aware of a broad scope of things. Um, and enough aware that I can speak intelligently and ask reasonable questions and be able to translate to folks who aren't technical and all that sort of thing, where someone who is uh, working on the front end or the back end or an ops or something is going to maybe have to work very hard to, to travel quickly in a tight, in a much tighter box. Um, so, I, uh, it's been long enough at this point. I, I've, I've dabbled at this point, you know, I, I play around with languages, but that's it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it is harder uh, at the engineering level to keep up with things, um, simply because if you're trying to keep a broad view, then you've got other stuff to do. And so I'm doing the best job I can. And that's, <laughs> that's what I got. Uh, while if you're going to 
uh, work in Go, then you're going to need to know what's going on in the language, what libraries are available, uh, what's coming up down the pike for Go2 or whatever. You're going to want to keep, keep connected to that technology and that community to a much greater degree than, than I suspect I do in this broad area. Mm, interesting. So uh, the people, the individual contributors are essentially having to um, keep up with all the very minutia of where the, the ecosystem is going, but at a manager level, it's more broad and more um, a general, general, uh, like having enough specialist knowledge to be able to communicate, but also kind of at the meta level, being able to understand the, where the whole thing is going. Yeah, exactly. And how it hooks together. Yeah. And then what do you think about this no code thing? Do you think that <laughs> do you, what, if, if, first of all, is no code viable? Second of all, is, uh, if no code does kind of take over a lot of development, where does that leave developers and what will developers continue to work on? So, <laughs> uh, we're looking at, so like is Webflow a good example of yep. no code? Is that, yeah. Um, I, so we just switched to Webflow. So I'm going to use that as a concrete example. Um, we just switched to Webflow and I just left uh, demo day effectively for our company. And uh, the designer on the uh, growth team was showing off the cool things they've done in Webflow lately. And they said, and he, and he said, uh, so naively, we thought that we wouldn't really need any engineering because look at all the things we can do in Webflow. But actually, they don't have the features we needed yet to do X or to do Y or to do Z. And so we asked the engineer to do it. And now we have this. And look how cool it is. <laughs> You know, I mean, it sounds a lot like coding, right? It's just we're coding at a different level on a different platform. Um, I, um, I'm assuming that it's similar to AI and all that, where my expectation is it's a new, uh, a new ground on that, that we're walking on, mm. and we still need to code on the ground. It's just a new higher level of abstraction, a new higher level of power. Um, that's my, my current guess. <laughs> and that's, that's, that is uh, insightful for me because uh, there, so there's a new level of abstraction. And so from some, somebody who's non-technical, I can look at it like, you know, first engineers were working on the actual hardware and how to make the hardware turn into software. And then, mm -hmm. and then within software, we've gone from lower level languages that are closer to the hardware to more and more and more and more abstraction. And then there's another layer of abstraction now, which is called no code, but in a sense, it's just kind of another layer of abstraction with on the margins of which still needs to be coded and still needs to be programmed. Right. Yeah. And so essentially it's a Sisyphusian thing that there will always be another level of abstraction under which there will always be more work to be done. Well, I mean, what's code other than trying to tell a device what you want it to do? You're, in, you're teaching it how to do something. Mm. And if I am teaching the AI how to discover pictures of monkeys, then I'm going to be showing it a bunch of monkeys and teaching it how to show monkeys. And that is a particular skill that you have to have right now of this is how you train. This is how you train, train a machine learning tool. And uh, if, I, uh, if I'm working on Webflow, yeah, I mean, like I'm going to be able to do a whole lot that I don't, you know, doesn't need a code. And then at some point I'm going to break glass and I want to be able to tell it, mm. Hey, I want you to do this. That's what coding is. Um, you know, there's uh, the dreams that pe people have had for decades now of being able to tell our computers to do stuff. I don't know. It like, <laughs> and there's probably lots of sci-fi books of like, you know, the genie misinterprets the command and <laughs> <laughs> the world explodes. Uh, you know, giving clear logical instructions is what coding is. And um, that probably isn't going anywhere. Hmm. Here's a question. What do you think, how have our, the cultural familiarity with computers uh, 
change the way human beings think? <laughs> okay, you're going for just small stakes questions here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, um, again, having kids, the, the first thing that comes to mind <laughs> is like seeing my kids with the, you know, the iPhone, iPhone neck, mm -hmm. uh, leaning down, staring at the, at the devices. Um, Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. just go straight for the big philosophical questions. And I mean, um, not, you just said something that made me think, which was that, so I grew up with technology. I didn't grow up in a, I mean, I had a dream when I was like 14 or 15 that I did want to learn it, but then I tried learning and it was just not, not for me at all. Um, but I grew up with technology it is a core piece of my kind of growth. And I've been talking a lot recently about video games and actually the person who introduced, introduced us, Ian, was talking about how video games got him into actually starting companies and programming and all this different stuff. And I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think that's uncommon. Uh, and, uh, so you mentioned your kids are, are like this and in a sense I had that, but with a computer, uh, and then it's, so if I ask myself that question, then for me, cause I grew up with a troubled, uh, troubled childhood, like computers were this thing that would never judge me uh, and that mm. were in a, in a sense always reliable except when they weren't and then they were really unreliable uh, <laughs> that happened a lot a lot more when I was growing up uh, that was when the computers were still you know pretty unpredictable and then I then I started to see this evolution of like uh, web apps and like they were almost always reliable and it's so interesting because I'm sure for somebody who's developing them like knows all the stuff that goes into that making sure that it's reliable all the time is there like it seems like magic for those who don't know how to do it but it's not magic right <laughs> <laughs> oh no it's magic <laughs> <laughs> pay me more money <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i mean uh i don't know uh this uh, it sounds like you're talking about uh, operational reliability um mm. we have uh, someone on staff who's really amazing at that. Uh, we also, our, our VP of product just came from Amazon who, you know, knows just a hair about that. And uh, yeah, it's, from my perspective, it's um, the discipline to identify when you need to invest in, uh, in automation that makes things work smoothly. Um, it's very easy to fall into the trap of building the next feature and building the next feature and building the next feature because that's what your customers want you to do. Um, and the challenge then is to recognize which part of the business must be reliable so much so that it's worth investing non-trivial amounts of time slash money in working on that when the end result to the end user for all they know is absolutely nothing mm -hmm. all the end result is is that they don't complain <laughs> <laughs> or they get this feeling of reliability uh, which is a feature but it's a it's a feature that's built very slowly over time. And as you know, as I think everybody knows, can be lost in a, in a snap, um, uh, where you start to lose trust in this thing that you thought was worth trusting your life to. And that sounds, so it sounds like a, uh, I might butcher this, but it's like a, a negative feature rather than a positive feature. And customers want these positive features that will be like the fireworks and the, 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 all the nice shiny stuff, but really like what they just don't know that they'd rather not have that. They, they, they just don't know that they'd rather have reliability, but they only know that once reliability isn't there. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you always have to run this balance across uh, the entire company to say, okay, we really want to go build X. And if we don't shore up Y, we're probably going to be in deep trouble. What's that balance? Where do we do that? Um, you know, is Z this other thing? Is it actually um, 
worth the investment or can we actually let that one sort of flip and flop a little bit and nobody will be too upset and we'll go off and build X. And this kind of gets into an analogy for human beings as well, because uh, I learned from Robert Sapolsky that uh, we have this, uh, who's a neurobiologist and he talks about the dopamine and the, what, what the dopamine system is all about. And it's all about reward and kind of motivating us to solve novel problems. Uh, and so there's a reason why we kind of get all the things we want and then we forget about all those wants we had because now we have them and then we look to new wants and it's like, and that's to help us solve novel, novel problems. Uh, but then there's a trap in that because if we're just, it's particularly in our society where we already have like all of the basics, we have them like met. Um, but then uh, like until they're not met and then once they're not met, we're just like totally like screwed. <laughs> and then, and then, and then there's this other component too, which is like, you know, you mentioned you have this family and like, uh, and, and to have a family and to be in relationship with other people, that's the real difficulty of being a human being because other human beings are so um, uh, complex and complicated and, and multivariate. And, um, and, and, and for a lot of us, particularly in my generation growing up with these computers, which are always reliable, but aren't really bi-directional. They're, they're just a channel in order to meet other people and, and do other things or play games and all this different stuff. And it's like, um, and so, so it's really easy to get our immediate needs met by the computer rather than dealing with these very difficult mm -hmm. and challenging people uh, who don't have that same sort of reliability <laughs> that the computers have been built to do. Yeah, yeah, which which really, I think, ties into video games, which you were mentioning before. Uh, that's, uh, you could probably frame that as uh, video games are trying to give you that dopamine hit explicitly mm -hmm. that is are fulfilled by, oh, look, I did this new thing. I did this novel thing. Of course, I accomplished absolutely nothing other than giving myself a dopamine hit, <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but it was pretty cool. <laughs> yep. That's a very good point. Um, and so for you doing a lot of remote work and work in general, and work seems it's different from this play thing, which is like solving kind of problems that are solving problems motivated by dopamine. This seems more like kind of responsibility and other things, but you, do you find enjoyment in your work and does that dopamine come back into your work? Oh gosh, yes. Uh, I was actually uh, thinking about that the other day. Um, I, you know, everybody, back to knowing yourself, everybody gets pleasure from different things. And one of the things, a couple of things that I have known for a while that really um, gets me excited are creating things mm. and connecting with people. Mm. And those are the things that really uh, get me going. And uh, coding, of course, gets the creating things. I mean, it, sometimes it feels like a video game because uh, you're able to create stuff and uh, I fixed a bug. Oh, look, I added a feature. It can, it can feel really fun. Um, and I find my job of building a team, building an organization, building a culture, uh, building a, uh, an organization that can accomplish a goal to be this incredible challenge filled with all of the complexity of people that you were talking about um, and some of the reliability of machines to some degree, because you're trying to build an automation, you're trying to build an expectations that people follow these particular patterns. And when things uh, work well, when, when you ship something and everybody's proud of it, when somebody is thrilled to be working at the company, when somebody uh, experiences growth and recognizes it and is excited about them like having become a, a richer person for having worked in this environment, that is super exciting and awesome. And I love it. And this, this is somewhat tangential, but it started to make me think about, well, I would love to understand in the remote work specific to that, how the growth component, how do you see growth? How does it work differently than if you're in an in-person um, kind of relationship? Cause it, uh, for most people who haven't worked remotely, they'd be, I, I'd imagine that they'd be like, 
that doesn't work. You, you need to be in person in order to, to motivate that growth or to kind of track that growth or allow mm. to build a system, a personal system, like a people system, not a, not a computing system to, that helps yes. people with growth. So how does that work in the remote environment? Yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated by this. Um, so uh, <laughs> to, I can start at the hard part. The hard part that I, I'm still, I feel like I'm working on, we're working on is juniors. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, the uh, part that I really feel thrilled with the answer for remote work. Um, are you familiar uh, Drive, the Daniel Pink book? Did you ever read that? I didn't know. Mm. Yeah, so one of his, his main points is that um, people often, well, historically people have thought of extrinsic motivators as the things that, that drive people. And that can be true for work that is repetitive, for work that is rote. Um, while if you have work that is creative, if you have work that is, uh, Intrinsic, intrinsically motivated, then you need completely different motivators to make that happen. And what you need to have there is you need to have people who are, who feel like they have meaning in their work. There's a purpose behind what they do. They have autonomy. They have a chance to actually shape the world and something else. I don't know, connection to people. He has some other third thing I forget, but uh, you know, like these are, a hundred percent things that you can provide remotely. Um, and, you know, sort of the classic uh, Dilbert pointy haired boss staring at the person in front of you, you know, what are you doing? That's, that's the way to motivate work that is uninspired. And if you want to get work that is, inspired and I don't know, that makes me feel like it's beautiful, you know, a beautiful environment, then you go for these intrinsic motivators. And uh, certainly part of those, that is a personal connection. And so, you know, one of the things we do at Manifold that we did at Heroku that I stole from Canonical back when they did it was that we all got together every two to four, two to four times a year, every year. Um, the entire company once or twice, and then smaller groups to build the connections that can make you feel like you're, that you can lean on the inspiration and the connection that you need for that kind of stuff. But that's uh, 100% um, fantastic with remote folks, particularly I think maybe with coding, where there's an aspect of it that is, um, that is is focused with one or two people and you can pair with somebody remotely, uh, that's fine. And then in terms of uh, actually building in accountability into remote work, there's really, I'd say two framings. Uh, one framing is um, getting a, uh, show me the code, you know, like, uh, there's, there've been movements for years now of, we don't need particularly hours of work. We need output. We need to see the output of the code. And in a remote environment, I think it's for the remote environments I like to build, it's very important to still have connections and, um, asynchronous connections are important, but I think it's really important to have daily options for synchronous connections. Like we're talking now, it builds connections and it builds the ability to move quickly. Um, but uh, the story that <laughs> I completely got distracted. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I, I I have something we can talk about from there, uh, unless you unless you remember. Yeah. Well, uh, there was another whole direction I wanted to go. The last third, third. I remember my third thing I wanted to go. The third thing I wanted to say was juniors. Juniors are freaking mm -hmm. hard, and um, the difficulty of juniors is that the uh, I have found that it really is helpful to have a person next to the junior to really help them connect we've tried a variety of ways to make that better where we have dedicated people we always have people 
who uh, come who, who meet when they're first joining the company and it's like they build a connection with someone to uh, lean on them. Um, we have a couple of juniors right now at Manifold who are doing really, really well. It's not something I've seen. Canonical didn't do it. Uh, when I was at Heroku, I think they're starting to do it now. Heroku wasn't really doing it. Um, it's tricky because all of the things that are difficult for remote work, um, I feel are doubly or triply or some multiplicatively uh, <laughs> difficult, uh, more difficult for juniors and helping juniors really grow. So yes, sorry for the long answer, but I'm excited about all this. I do think people really can grow hugely in a remote environment. And I think they grow in a way that is um, uh, on, honestly, we're forced into the kinds of ways that I believe help people grow the most. We can't do extra, uh, extrinsic motivation. We have to do intrinsic motivation, which is going to help people grow. Mm. That's my take. It's really insightful. And there is a question that's going to be coming up again and again is that, so you've now had three jobs within the remote work. And I imagine that developing um, development is easier to find a new job with remote work because it's, you have this output that's very clear, but you're, but you're also a manager. And I'm wondering, so if, if, if I were to switch jobs and, you know, say, say I wanted to get a job in politics, I would, in, in, in DC, I'd imagine that I'd move there, I'd go there and I'd go to a bunch of cocktail parties and I'd meet a bunch of people. And then I, that I, that that's the way that I would like uh, find out about the new opportunities and, and find myself a job and talk to the right people and stuff like that. And I wonder what is the equivalent for finding a new job in the remote work? Well, I mean, so there's two sides of that maybe that I'll call out one side being discovery and the other side being, um, getting hired and succeeding. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you're asking about discovery, but the other side is connected in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, on the discovery side, there are a number of, uh, locations that you can find remote work offered. Um, so uh there's a github list i could if you wanted to you know send it as a, an attachment i can find a github list of a whole bunch of different companies that all hire remotely uh there are a number of remote job boards that i've used um we've had a lot of success with power to fly which is a remote job board for um females people identifying as females um so the um the opportunities to find jobs in the engineering world are pretty significant these days. Um, it maybe is hard to find those. Um, I think Google will help you find the job boards really fast. Uh, I didn't know about that uh, GitHub list until relatively recently. And that's pretty nice to just be like, here are the companies that are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other side I was going to say was the hiring and success side of it if you've never done it before and i have a, a shtick at this point during my uh, interviews uh when i interview somebody and i say have you ever uh, worked remotely before and if they haven't then i say this is completely up to you like uh, this is not me asking you questions this is me telling you the challenges that are in front of you and remote work is hard there's a few reasons why remote work is hard. One of the reasons it's hard is that you can easily get lost and you can just work and work and work because there's no distinction between your work of your place of work and your home. And that's, this is all stuff that people are, who are, who follow remote work are familiar with. But you know, I tell people that I also tell people, uh, make sure that you have some way in your life, that you're connecting to people physically, like actually <laughs> like seeing people in the flesh on a regular basis, um, family, friends, uh, meetups, something, because I have known people who loved remote work who left it because they just didn't make those connections. And then they had a connection physical and it was just like, 
wow, <laughs> seeing people, this is great. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I tell those to people and, and make sure they are aware of it because I, don't, I can't evaluate that for people. Um, and this is back to knowing yourself, what we were talking about before. Um, and it's hard sometimes for people to know themselves, but I feel like the, the, uh, the chance of them knowing themselves is a lot higher than me figuring out whether it's going to work out for them. And at least they can go into their eyes open. Um, so that when you were talking about going into, uh, the cocktails, uh, getting some cocktails, that's what made me think of, you know, like I don't need people to have had remote experience before, but I do need people to understand that it's going to feel different. And then how do you evaluate that, that, uh, that the second part you mentioned, maybe you already answered that part, but the, the, not just the discoverability, but the, the setting up for success, like finding mm -hmm. the right company and everything. Uh, well, um, <laughs> there's a lot of answers for remote work where I feel like the answer is pretty much just what you do for normal jobs. I mean, uh, there are certainly aspects of remote work where um, if you're going to be the remote person, a um, if you're going to go work at an all remote company, there's a good chance that they've sorted um, challenges out. If you're going to work at a partially distributed company, or mm -hmm. where in particular where you're like one of a relatively small percentage, that can be super tricky and can leave you super isolated. Um, and I... Uh, my rule of thumb, both for teams and for companies is have at least 40% of your people distributed. So if you have a group of, um, if you have a group of five people, then at least two of them are distributed. If you have a group of three people, at least two of them are distributed. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because uh, otherwise, it's just too easy to talk to the person next to you and say, Hey, what's up and leave out the other person. So Again, as a job hunter, um, that's something I would be very cautious of um, if I were going to go into a partially distributed team where I was going to be one of the, you know, two people of 10. <sighs> risky, very risky in my experience. Are, does your team or have any of the other companies that you've worked with, do they ever have... Um, uh, perks has anybody figured out perks that are just particularly for distributed work so the thing that i think about is like yoga teachers for google like google has all of these different things that they they offer to their employees but do digital do uh do remote workers get any of that at all well i mean it i'll answer that as you know what are the kinds of perks i've seen there are definitely options and it depends on where you're working what will um what'll happen. The um, easy ones are usually you get a computer, you get a monitor, you know, sort of the obvious ones, um, at least for companies that are associated with the Silicon, with Silicon Valley, you know, you're going to get some of that stuff typically. Um, other kinds of perks are going to be, um, uh, you know, like we're going to give you the such and such amount of money per month in order to pay for your, your health, the same sort of thing you would another company. We're going to give you such an amount of money to go to a conference or to uh, do something like that. Uh, the more interesting ones that I think are specific to remote work um, are things like uh, we've started doing something called, we call a brain feed because it's not, it's a lunch and learn, but we have people in who are for whom it's breakfast and people for whom it's lunch. So it's a brain feed. <laughs> and, uh, and for that, for remote folks, we say, if you're going to come to that, then you can spend, I think it's 15 bucks uh, and expense it and get a lunch and watch on the, uh, on zoom. And you're going to be able to um, see what's going on and participate and, and have that kind of thing. And then, I don't know, the last one I'll mention is that uh, as a remote perk, I don't know if this is a perk exactly, but I don't know, team building or something, uh, we have in Slack groups that get together and we've had sort of the obvious, let's all go play video games together. Um, the less obvious <laughs> uh, folks just had a, um, 
let's all chat while we do crafts together. <laughs> uh, cool. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, and you know, sometimes that includes uh, giving a meal or doing something else to support the, the remote activity. Um, yeah, so it is, it takes some innovation, I guess, more than usual to think about what might work as well as some experimentation because ideas that you think are fabulous might end up not working so great. Um, but there are absolutely options for perks um, ranging from equivalent to the typical, like health um, and working out, uh, to the more unusual that might be more similar to, oh, look, we're doing this fun thing in the office today. Mm, very cool. So this seems like a good time to wrap up. How can people find out more about what you're, what you're doing and, and uh, kind of follow your remote work journey kind of thing? Yeah, um, <laughs> I don't have any uh, particular personal blog to follow. Uh, go to manifold.co and I have some blogs up there I've written, uh, including a bunch of blogs actually, blog posts about remote work. Um, and uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm happy for folks to reach out to me, uh, Gary at manifold.co, if you want to say hi. Cool. Thank you, Gary, so much. Okay. Thanks, Stuart.